It is my great pleasure and honor to have Dr. Morton Halperin as a guest of Insight today. Dr. Halperin has a very unique career. He studied his career as a professor of Harvard University, and then later he worked for the Pentagon and National Security Council of White House and then State Department. And it is a great pleasure for us to have him here in Seoul at Arirang TV. Dr. Halperin, what brought you here in Seoul? I came to Korea for the Jeju Forum where I was on two panels, one on democracy promotion and one on uh, the possibility of a nuclear weapons free zone in Northeast Asia. And now I'm spending a few days in Seoul. A few days ago, North Korea announced that uh, it uh, amended the Constitution on April 13th of 2012 included nuclear weapons as one of its you know, goals of the North Korean government. What is the assessment of the North Korean statement? Well, I think it's an unfortunate statement and one that will make the task of having a permanent denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula more difficult, but I think not impossible. Uh, I still think that if we can offer the right understandings and agreements with the North Koreans and proceed on a step-by-step -step basis towards them, that it is still possible to persuade uh, the Pyongyang government to give up its nuclear weapons. But are there contending views of North Korean nu nuclear weapons capability? Some scholars and experts argue that the North Korea is just still far away from uh, getting into a nuclear weapon state. You know, it, in North Korea, okay, there are several ways of judging whether North Korea is truly full-fledged nuclear weapon state or not, uh, whether North Korea has a nuclear warhead, and whether it has an, uh, credible delivery vehicles, such as missiles and uh, nuclear testings, mm -hmm. and also miniaturization technology to uh, make the nuclear warhead smaller so that they can mount on short-range and intermediate-range missiles. Out of those four criteria, what is your judgment on the North Korea's nuclear weapons you know, capability? Well, I think we don't really know for sure, because North Korea is, not, is a very secretive place. I think what we do know is that North Korea has some plutonium that's weapons-grade plutonium. Whether they have manufactured that into a weapon of any kind, we don't really know. I think it's extremely doubtful that they have been able to produce a weapon that's small enough uh, to be put on an, even in an airplane. And I think it is virtually certain that they do not have a weapon that could go on any kind of a missile and that they are very far from having an operational missile capability as well. So only in a very notional sense is North Korea now a nuclear weapon state. Are you then implying that North Korean nuclear weapons is not really in a real threat but it's symbolic or contrived threat? I think North Korean nuclear weapons are not a real threat, but I don't believe anybody's nuclear weapons are a real threat because I think the lesson of the acquisition of nuclear weapons by China, by India, by Pakistan, perhaps by North Korea, demonstrates that these are not really weapons, that they're not really useful for any purpose, uh, that they don't deter attacks and they don't, they're not very good at coercion. So I think even if the North had a, quote, real nuclear weapon, it would still, in my view, not be an actual weapon that could be used in any way. But I think the fact is that they have a very modest and limited uh, nuclear capacity. But Americans are not really concerned about the actual nuclear threat coming from North Korea, but a lot of American experts are concerned, very much concerned about potential proliferation of uh, nuclear materials to other parts of the world so that they can go to the, in the hands of the terrorists and right. etc. What, you know, what is your assessment of that kind of possibility? I guess I worry much less than many people do about nuclear materials getting in the hands of terrorists. Nuclear weapons are very hard to manufacture, even if you have fissional material, and they're even harder to deliver anywhere. So while we know that al-Qaeda talked in general terms about it would be nice to have nuclear weapons, there actually is, as far as I can tell, no evidence that they actually did anything to pursue that goal. And if al-Qaeda, at the height of bin Laden's power and before 9-11, 
didn't make much progress in this regard, as now is clear, I think. It's very unlikely, I think, that any terrorist group will ever have the capacity to, to do that. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't be prudent, and I think the nuclear summit that was held in Seoul was very useful um, in encouraging states to make sure that they have effective controls over their fissionable material. Then why U.S. Congress, particularly House, has recently in added so-called recommendation of retransfer of American tactical nuclear weapons to South Korea to its uh, Defense Authorization Act of uh, 2012? Well, I think it's a manifestation of a long-standing effort on the part of some Republicans, including Republicans who dominate the House Armed Services Committee, to try to find uses for nuclear weapons, to try to develop new weapons that can penetrate the earth or can uh, be used against particular uh, targets. I think it's a very foolish idea and a very misplaced idea because I think what we should be trying to do and what I think the Obama administration is trying to do is to extend the moratorium on the use of nuclear weapons, which now has lasted more than 60 years and which is a single most important thing in the world, in my view, is to make sure that no country ever uses nuclear weapons again. So instead of desperately looking for some possible way to use nuclear weapons, we should be looking for ways to reinforce the moratorium. Moreover, the harder you look at particular ways to use nuclear weapons, the less likely and the less desirable they seem to be. And I think it's extremely unlikely that any American president we break the taboo on using nuclear weapons for some tactical advantage in some conflict. But it's very ironical that because it was George W. Bush who you know, got rid of tactical nuclear weapons from South Korea, that the Republican congressmen are pushing back uh, mm. for the idea of a retransfer of tactical nuclear weapons to South Korea, that some South Koreans are very much confused. Right. Well, there are, there are two views within the Republican Party on this issue. There's the Republican Party of George Bush Sr. and uh, Colin Powell, and in, in the old days, Dick Cheney, who I think has changed his view, and Ben Stokroft and Hadley, who are very much internationalists, who were committed to putting controls on nuclear weapons. After all, it was the Nixon administration that gave us the first strategic arms treaty in which champion controls on nuclear weapons and gave us the ABM treaty. Uh, there's another strand in the Republican Party which is against the ABM treaty, which is against the test ban treaty, which is in favor of trying to develop new nuclear weapons uh, for uh, new purposes. And those are the Republicans who dominate the House Armed Services Committee. But there remains a split within the party, and I think it remains to be seen uh, where Mr. Romney is on this set of issues. So what is your prediction on Romney? I think that at the end of the day, he will uh, come down on the international side of these issues. Then suppose the United States is likely to refuse transport or redeployment of tactical nuclear weapons in South Korea. Right. If under that circumstance, then there is a possibility that South Koreans may go for nuclear weapons without American, you know, interference and etc. Maybe yeah. by then, maybe we can give it up, hold this uh, extended deterrence, you know, notion, and also we may just give it up American nuclear umbrella, and we just go ahead to our own nuclear weapons development like North Korea. Yeah. Would it be feasible? It would be a very bad idea. It would be very difficult. South Korea would become an outcast nation in the world. And you certainly would have to give up your American nuclear guarantees. The United States will not maintain nuclear guarantees to any state which breaks out of the NPT process. There's just no support for that in the United States. And developing nuclear weapons is very dangerous. It's very costly. It's very hard to have a secure second strike capability. Then do you believe then combined forces uh Combined conventional forces of South Korea and the United States would be sufficient to deal with the North Korean nuclear threat? Yes, I do. Uh, I believe that the North Koreans know that if they use, if they attack South Korea or American forces in the neighborhood, whether they do it with conventional weapons or with nuclear weapons, that they will be destroyed in a very short period of time 
that the leadership of the country will be captured and held accountable for their illegal actions. And the other Korean people will be freed of the, of the regime in which they live. Then now, we can have a nuclear weapons. Right. Okay? At the same time, uh, it would be very difficult for us to, to use you know, even conventional military means in dealing with North Korea. Right. Now, six-party talks are now stalled. What options are available for us? Well, I think we need to start over and develop a new approach to dealing with North Korea. And the approach, I think, has to start with trying to develop a comprehensive treaty that would deal with all of the outstanding security issues in Northeast Asia. I think that treaty has to include a peace treaty. It has to include a treaty of, of friendship. It has to include a tr commitment to non-belligerency and non-hostility. Uh, it has to include the creation of a permanent Northeast Asian security structure, and it has to include a commitment for a nuclear weapons-free zone, which would include Japan and South Korea as well as North Korea. But since North Korea is test launching a rocket on April 13th, now United States, South Korea, Japan, even China and Russia, have become extremely critical of North Korea. And I don't see any immediate chance to resume six party talk process. Mm -hmm. Now, how can we overcome current in a stalemate? I think we have to be patient. I think given that there's a U.S. government election coming up, there's a South Korean government coming up, and the North Korean government is very new in power, I would be astonished if anything could get settled in the rest of this year. But I think it's not too soon to start preparing for next year and beyond. And I think that, in my view, means intensive discussions between first the United States, Korea, and Japan, and then later uh, the Chinese and the Russians need to be brought into the process, and eventually the North Koreans. But, in fact, I met the North Korean delegate in New York in early March, and we talked about, you know, what are the best ways of denuclearizing North Korea? And North Korean delegate response was straightforward. First, recognize us. Let us respect sovereignty on the, on the mutual basis. Let us have deploying normalization. It won't cost any money. And let us have some kind of peace treaty so that we, c we can be free from any kinds of external threats. Okay? But the American response no, we cannot do that. Unless you show some concrete signs of denuclearization, then we cannot get a congressional support for the, any kind of rectification of peace treaty or diplomatic normalization. Mm -hmm. How can we resolve this catch-22 situation? Well, it's precisely because of this that I think we have to do it all at once. We have to agree, and it will take, I think, a couple of years to do it, on the text of a comprehensive treaty. It's a peace treaty, it's a treaty of normalization of relations, it's a treaty of non-hostility, it's a treaty that guarantees all the parties access to peaceful nuclear power, it's a treaty that ends the Korean War once and for all, and it's a treaty that establishes a nuclear weapons-free zone uh, of the two Koreas and Japan, which the United States and China and Russia and perhaps also Britain and France agree to, to respect. Once we have the text of a treaty, which we will first have to negotiate among ourselves, then with China and then Russia and then with North Korea, once we have that comprehensive treaty and everybody knows what the end state will look like, then we can start negotiating steps towards that end state with everyone noticing, knowing what it is and how we're going, what it's going to look like at the end of the day. Then I think we've got to devise step-by-step -step confidence building measures. But they have to have the form, not of the agreements we've signed in the past, which have been riddled with ambiguities. And the North Koreans have literally agreed to some things. We've said, no, it must mean these other things as well. They say nothing. Then we say this is what they agreed to. And they say, no, it's not what we agreed to. I think we have to have concrete agreements which spell out exactly what's agreed to and what's not agreed to. So if there's something that's concrete that we've agreed to do in terms of providing uh, 
heavy water or reactor. It's got to be precisely stated the timing of when we do it. If it has to be uh, in lockstep with other things that they promise to do, I think we have to work that out. But the agreements have to be very specific. They can't allow for enough ambiguity that both sides do some piece of it and then come back and say, but you didn't do your share. But look, devils are in detail. Right. That once you get into that kind of very specific agreement, they may not be able to reach any agreement at all. Then how can we overcome such a kind of dilemma? Well, I think the problem with what we've agreed to so far is that they've been agreements of general principles. They've been not legally binding commitments. And so you have two problems. One is they're often just ambiguous as to what they mean. And second, each any state can walk away from them because they're not legally binding treaties. They're simply agreements that the government of the day in any one country uh, may may agree to. And second, they've been the agreements themselves have been full of ambiguity, so that uh, the Korean, the North Koreans have promised some specific thing. We then interpret it as a much broader commitment. What is your forecasting on this combination of political leadership and the peaceful settlement of North Korean nuclear issue next year? Well, I think nothing's going to happen this year. I think that uh, the election makes this an inappropriate time. It's unlikely that anything will be done. In the United States, after the election, hopefully we will have Mr. Obama in his second term. As I write in my book, presidents in their second term start thinking about the history book. They start thinking about what will they be remembered for. And they often want to be remembered as a person of peace. And so I think there's a real chance that Mr. Obama will turn his attention uh, to this issue, as Mr. Clinton did in his last days. I think the Clinton administration had been three months longer, or if President Clinton had realized that the Middle East was not going to happen and he focused on North Korea, I think we would have had an agreement. I think if President Bush had continued the process, we would have had an agreement then. So my hope is that Mr. Obama will do something. And what is your advisor to China? Well, I think the Chi I mean, I think the Chinese very much want an agreement. I think they do not want uh, the North Koreans to further develop their nuclear weapons. They want to see a denuclearized peninsula. But they want even more not to see disintegration in North Korea and chaos in North Korea, which leads to a refugee problem, which leads to a problem of instability on the Korean peninsula. So we have to persuade the Chinese that we have a framework which denuclearizes Korea without destabilizing the North Korean government and, in fact, contributes to a gradual process of moderation and reform uh, in North Korea. I also think that if you put this in the context of a nuclear weapons free zone for the entire peninsula and for Japan, it gives the Chinese an added incentive to put more pressure on the North Korean, on the North Koreans because they know they're getting something that they very badly want, which is a reaffirmation of the denuclear policy of Japan and of South Korea. I also think it would provide a context in which the United States and China could talk to each other about potential security problems on the peninsula and how they might cooperate to make sure they did not get out of control. What is your advisor to new leadership in North Korea? Well, I think the North Korean leadership needs to understand that they cannot be part of the world in any meaningful way if they continue to develop nuclear weapons. And that that means they're going to be isolated in a way that we've now come up with a new set of what are called targeted sanctions. And these are sanctions not on the country as a whole, but on the leadership and on their children and on their grandchildren. And it prevents them from having bank accounts abroad, and it prevents them from traveling abroad. It prevents them from shopping in Paris or studying at Harvard. And I think, I think that's one of the things that brought about the change in Burma now that the sons and daughters of the generals said there's no point in stealing money if we can't spend it and if we can't go anywhere. And I think the North Korean leadership needs to understand that they're now in the same place, that they may be able to stay in power by continuing to have a very autocratic regime, 
but they cannot get any of the benefits that people get from being in power unless they become again part of the world and that the UN Security Council is united in saying that they will not be welcomed into the world in any way unless they give up their nuclear capability. So I think we need to offer them a reasonable way for them to give up their nuclear capability, but then they need to understand that they need to take that opportunity. Thank you very much, Mot. And I think Dr. Halpern gave us really wonderful advices. First, we got to have a more realistic assessment of North Korean intention and capability regarding its nuclear, nuclear weapons. Second, hold this concept of balance of terror or redeployment of tactical weapon, nuclear tactical weapons may not be the solution. The only solution is dialogue, negotiation. In this regard, there must be resumption of six time talks in the near future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.